Good morning, everyone. Reverend Dwight Lee Walter here, Congregational Church of Patchogue. I keep forgetting, for a month I've forgotten to tell you this, if you hit like or you make a comment, even hello, checking in, anything like that, that increases our prominence on uh, Facebook Live uh, in their algorithm, and it means, oh, this um, Facebook Live uh, episode is getting some action. We get a lot of action on this, actually, much more so than we did if it was just Sunday morning here in the church normally. So if you click like, comment, anything like that while this is going on, that uh, increases our visibility and other people can uh, have access to it. Also, if you get a chance to go on our website, churchonmainstreet.org, street is spelled out, churchonmainstreet.org. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a uh, donate button, which would be very helpful for us. As we've mentioned before, most likely we're going to be closed in this sanctuary for various reasons. The number one is safety until uh, at least September. So, on an unrelated subject, in a way, for several years now, I think it's almost eight years, I have written a series of narrative and musical events known as the spirituality of popular music. We did one combination between Zoom live performances and a Facebook Live broadcast from here with just Craig and I, uh, the spirituality of Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam. Um, just about a, you know, several, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago. So the Spirituality of Popular Music is a series I've done for about eight years, um, musical and narrative events. It began with an epiphany that most of the love songs I was hearing from my favorite artists, most of the love songs I was hearing from my favorite artists could not possibly have been written about a human being. It just dawned on me. I was a poet as a young kid. I wrote these unbelievable poems, love poems, to Nancy. Well, I was in sixth grade. It's like, how could I possibly be writing about Nancy? I was writing about something yearning, connecting deep within me. It couldn't possibly have been this sixth grade girl. It was in me or coming somehow through me. And I saw in my car and at home listening to music, wow, it seems very similar with these songs I'm hearing from my favorite artists that they're not writing about a particular person either, necessarily. As Bob Dylan once wrote, you say you're looking for someone who's never weak, but always strong, who gathers flowers constantly and who comes each time you call, a lover for your life and nothing more. Well, it ain't me, babe. No, 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 that ain't me, babe. It ain't me you're looking for. Then who are these lonely lovers lamenting over, and what are they looking for? My belief and my research of the last several years into this is that these songs portray a lover seeking divinity in human form. Think about it. You're about to go on a first date and you're so hopeful, and this is a person who will understand, and you can understand them, and they'll be with you through thick and thin, and you'll be with them through thick and thin, and it'll be fun, it'll be erotic, it'll be joyful, laughter, you'll go interesting places and end to isolation and loneliness. You haven't even gone on a first date yet. How could it possibly be in that person? That's in you or in something that's passing through you that you're making connection with. And you put it on a human being because that's what we do as human beings. We seek it in other human beings. So my research was proved in a way by the fact that many of the lovers looked for were no longer in the lives of the artists and therefore lost. In other words, half of the lovers that are being written about in these songs, their marriages might have ended in divorce. That's a national statistic. Why would this be any different? Or they've gotten sick and passed away. But where is the love? Where has the love gone, if anywhere? The identity of the lover written about is usually not revealed or even relevant. Dream lover. That doesn't say... Nancy or Mary or Bill or Bob, 
my dream lover. It just says dream lover, almost like a generic term. Or that it's the dream more so than the lover that is significant. It is the quest for love, the longing for connection to, I believe, a higher power, however you define that higher power to be, that proves that loves you in a way that no human being could that remains. What remains after the object of our writing, of our longing, of our songs, of our poems, of our thoughts, of our hopes and dreams may move on from us. But what remains is that longing for a connection to a power that is greater than ourselves, a power of love. We dream of love. To love and to be loved is the ultimate quest, manifest in countless songs of longing and devotion. In just a moment, we're going to hear a lovely song called Dream Lover, written by Bobby Darren and released to great uh, acclaim in 1959. This is clearly not a religious song. Craig thinks it's about a guy that wants to have an intimate relationship with a woman, plain and simple. And I said, yeah, but he didn't say I want a sex partner. He didn't want to say I want someone to go to ball games with. He said, I want a dream lover so I don't have to dream alone. It was the dream that he was seeking. And that dream might be of physical connection, emotional connection, spiritual connection, connection to a purpose things that you have in common, fun, joy, purpose. I believe this song, therefore, is not religious, but I do believe that it is profoundly hopeful and spiritual, and it's fun. I believe the attributes we long for and sometimes find, sometimes find in another human lover, are the specks of divinity that we find in each other. The things that are triggering these deep emotions in us are little pieces, morsels, tidbits of God that are deeply within each other. And it is that that we're connecting to, this universal love greater than our human understanding. Imagine if our love is to love God with all our heart and to make connection with the love that originates, emanates, and radiates from the heart of God into each and every one of us. As we hear in the song now, every night I hope and pray such a dream lover will come my way. I hope and pray a dream lover will come my way, a girl to hold in my arms and know the magic of her charms because I want a girl to call my own. I want a dream lover so I don't have to dream at all. come true because I want
So let's talk more specifically about dreams for a moment. Do you know of, if this was a live in person, you, uh, you, this would be a call and response where I'd ask you a couple questions and you'd shout back the answers. But you can uh, shout all you want from your house, but guess what, I can't hear you. So do you know of a Native American and First Nation apparatus made of a hoop with strings and beads attached in the center? It's called a what? A blank catcher. That's right. It's a dream catcher. And what about the Shakespeare play, A Midsummer Night's Dream? And Martin Luther King's famous speech, I have a dream. And how about we're going to get married and move into our blank house, our dream house. A few years ago, legislation was passed that would have offered permanent conditional residence to certain undocumented students who were brought to the United States as children. It was called the what act? The dream act. And now, a couple of songs of Bobby Darren's song, Dream Lover. Another song, The Impossible Dream, that we'll be hearing later on. And think of the movie, 1989, long time ago, called A Field of Dreams. Many dreams are also mentioned in the Bible, many, many times. Joseph, in the book of Genesis, was a prisoner in Egypt. He was an Israelite, and for a long story, he had been captured, sold into slavery. He's a prisoner in Egypt. And in prison, there's a reputation that he's a dream interpreter. So all the other prisoners who have dreams go, Joseph, what's this dream mean? Sort of like Carl Jung, the psychiatrist, or Sigmund Freud, dream interpreters, a lot of people. And there are those who say, you can't interpret dreams. It's just like throwing spaghetti against the wall. Some, they stick, it doesn't. They form different shapes. It's like Rorschach. They don't mean anything. And other people say, oh, yes, they do. They're highly symbolic. But Joseph was taken from prison to visit Pharaoh because Pharaoh had dreamed a strange dream that perplexed all of his advisors, the greatest spiritualists and politicians and philosophers and thinkers of his day and in his inner sanctum. Couldn't figure this dream out. So Pharaoh told Joseph that he dreamed of seven stalks of grain, healthy stalks of grain, that were father, followed by seven withered, sickly stalks of grain. And then he dreamed of seven fat cows, plump, healthy, well-fed, followed by seven horribly lean and sickly cows, well, Joseph had not no problem interpreting his dreams. Joseph told Pharaoh that his dreams meant that there would be seven good years, healthy grain, fields of grain, amber waves of grain, and food and plenty for everyone. And those seven good years would be followed by seven years of drought. So that dream interpretation convinced Pharaoh to warehouse grain during the seven years of good and plenty in preparation for the seven years of drought, thus saving countless lives when the drought did come, seven consecutive years of it. Elsewhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, Mary is visited in a dream by an angel who tells her that she's going to become the mother of Jesus. And another Joseph, the stepfather, who was the betrothed of Mary, had a dream in which he was told after Jesus was born, take Mary and Joseph and go where? To Egypt. To hide out because Herod is going to come hunting for him. 300 years later, Constantine the Great was faced with a desperate battle. And in the dream, in a dream, he had a vision of a cross on the shields, of a cross in the sky. So he had that cross painted on the shields of all of his warriors. And against great odds, they won the battle. A dream saved Egypt from famine. A dream saved the Holy Family from execution. A dream ended 300 years of the persecution of Christians by the Roman Empire as Constantine adopted Christianity as his faith. And a speech about a dream inspired generations 
to continue their struggle for freedom, equity, equality, liberty, and justice for all. That dream, of course, is the dream, I have a dream speech from Martin Luther King Jr. In the film Field of Dreams, a farmer listens to a disembodied voice. And I always thought, is that, the bo is that his conscience? Is that the voice of God? It says, build it and they will come. This voice recognizes his deep, impossible dream. That he, what he dreamed of was, was not going to work at all. He didn't even let it come into his conscious mind. But this voice keeps saying, build it, build it, and they will come. They'll come. And so he builds a baseball field in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a field, and people come. Field of Dreams struck a deep chord back in 1989. It struck a deep chord in the American psyche and became a symbol of hope for millions and millions of people, seeking such things as the American dream of owning a home. But... Since 1989, recession, prejudice, redlining, now pandemic, lots of problems have made the American dream an abandoned one. So where are our dream lovers, our dream homes, our dreams of equality and justice and freedom? And where are these bold dreamers that we see in scripture and movie and speeches and slogans and cliches? legislation in the hearts of people who are brought here unbeknownst to them as infants, raised only in this country, know only this country, and now want, have a dream of being able to stay here. Where are these dreamers? What we need now, I believe, is a new field of dreams. We suffer from dream deficiency. If we don't get a good balance of food and water, we get sick. If we don't get a good balance of dreams and wakefulness, we get sick as well. We might not be able to dream up all the ways to solve all of our problems of our country, but we can make much progress in our lives and community. Together, let us build, not necessarily in this space, in this sanctuary, but let us build in this sanctuary that is not open but the sanctuary in our hearts and in our covenant with each other is wide open. And let us build a sanctuary in our hearts and in our relationships and in our country and our communities for people who have given up on their dreams, given up on hope itself, and have nowhere else to turn for spiritual nurture but to you. Our love and active concern for others can provide a spiritual home for outcasts and outsiders, for widows and orphans, as well as healthy and hopeful people. Together we can remember the nightmares of past times when injustice and hatred seem to have gained the upper hand, but we can also remember the dreams and the dreamers whose visions led to this moment of insight and inspiration and change, even in the midst of a pandemic. Lest we choose to go and live and believe in the nightmare, lest we choose to collapse into cynicism and despair and negativity and depression and anxiety and fear and all of that, that's ours also if we so choose. But we can choose to rekindle these dreams. Now is the time to dream. But I don't want to dream alone. I want to dream with you. Together, with the help of and the love of God, as our ally and our companion, we can help reach people who will then in turn reach the highest tiers of their dreams and hold fast to those dreams. The book of Exodus in the Bible was a story of slavery. But the uh, slaves in America saw it as, let my people go. They knew what they wanted to zero in on. It wasn't like, well, they weren't singing old spiritual songs about give up, we're, we're up the creek without a paddle. It was wade in the water. Wade in the water. Float upstream. Find freedom even in servitude. 
And when we do dream, let us not forget to listen to our dreams and to pay attention to our dreams the way Joseph of Egypt, Joseph of Nazareth, Constantine the Great, William Shakespeare, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Man of La Mancha, a play, a song from which we'll hear soon. Your dreams, my dreams. My dream is that all of what we're experiencing now is ultimately going to prove, even against my own doubts, to be a time of spiritual reckoning, of reconciliation, of getting back to the basics and the fundamentals of what's valuable. I have a quarter, one quarter in my pocket. I've had it there for four months. Where do I spend it? I don't need to spend it. I don't need even that quarter. What I need is hope, love, and a way to sustain my dreams while other people are declaring that what I'm experiencing is a nightmare. We are now in the midst of a dream. We don't make judgment. When we're dreaming at night, you don't say, oh, don't take this too seriously. This is only a dream you're having. When we're dreaming at night, we don't say, boy, is this a stupid dream. I mean, come on, you, you're, you're smarter than that. This is like a really boring dream, Dwight, Mary, Craig, Sue, Eve, Kathleen, Diane. This is really a stupid dream. You shouldn't be having this dream. It's too negative. No, we dream the dream, period, and we dream it without editing. We just let our dreams happen. We work with them. They, we let them work with us. We believe them. We soar with them. Some of us keep pen and paper by the bed so that we can quickly jot down the dream as we lie awake in the middle of the night, lest we forget it come morning. Fulfilling dreams is not always easy. In the field of dreams, for example, which sounds so great, build it and they will come. Poof, there's a ballpark. Everybody comes. Yay. Dreams fulfilled. I told you, honey. I told you that we weren't going to go. No, no, no. It wasn't that easy. First, the farmer was directed by a disembodied voice, which I hear as God, to build a baseball diamond in a cornfield on a failing farm in the middle of Iowa. There was a ton of work to be done. A field of dreams must be cultivated like a field of crops. We need to remove the weeds and the stones of doubt and fear. We need to plant healthy seeds of hope and love and longing and peace and belief in the inherent goodness of people. A belief in our creed of liberty and justice for all. Of our creed that we are all one in God and not one exception to us being a child of God. We need to believe that the Holy Spirit of God is still speaking to us and guiding us to where our field of dreams still lie. By the way, do you think God dreams? What does God dream about? I believe God dreams about us the way a mother dreams of good things that lie in store for all of her children. Dream lovers. But I don't want to dream alone. I was not meant to dream alone. Imagine if we all dreamed on the same night We set it up with our readings and our thoughts and our prayers and our contemplations and the music and phone conversations. We set it up so that our dreams of peace, of unity and justice, we would all dream it at the same time, on the same day, the same night. Would that change the world? Imagine all the people living life of peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I believe even in the impossible dreams. 
made possible through you and me. dream the impossible dream to fight the unbeatable foe to bear with unbearable sorrow to run where the brave dare not go to ride the unrightable star this is my quest to follow that star no matter how hopeless no matter how far to fight for the right without question or pause to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause and I'll know That my heart will lie peaceful and calm as I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this, that one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage. Hope and dreams is a hard act to follow, but we don't have to follow. We can walk side by side into our dreams. Now, we are a clapping, hooting, yelling, affirming kind of church. So if the people were here, you'd be hearing a lot of bravos and, and yay, Craig, and uh, people being happy. But we don't have that. But you can hit like and you can hit a comment. That will also help us let the uh, leaders of this church, the elected leaders of this church, know that uh, this is something that you value, and therefore they should value. And now, for those who care to join, using whatever words with which you may be most familiar, let us pray aloud and together, wherever we are, gathered or scattered, the prayer that our faith tradition tells us that Jesus himself taught to the original disciples when they said, but how do we pray? And Jesus said, let us pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now in our going and until we meet again, may the light and the heat and the humidity of God shine down upon us and out from within us and bring us peace. And then at day's end, I bid to you, sweet dreams. <laughs>